Have you ever thought about what it takes to be a leader? Do you have to have a certain background? Do you have to be perfect all the time? Do you have to have all the answers? And do those answers have to be right? Not necessarily. The part of the story that we're going to be looking at today in AP US history is about a group of leaders who weren't perfect, who had various backgrounds that weren't all entitled, who became leaders and created the new nation of the United States. I'm Dr. Rhonda Webb, and tonight on AP Daily Live Review, we are going to be looking at time periods one and two. So let's look a little bit more closely at uh, our topics for tonight. I'm glad that you've come back from yesterday's session. Let's go ahead and get started. So tonight, time period three is our focus. We are looking at the French and Indian War up through the first few presidents of the United States in 1800. So all of those topics of time period three will be very important. And we're gonna be talking about a lot of leaders, again, from various backgrounds and people who weren't perfect. We're also going to definitely focus on a lot of skills and a lot of writing tonight. We'll be looking at the short answer question again. We looked at that yesterday. The non-stimulus-based questions we looked at yesterday. Today, we're going to focus on the passage style questions. And my students tend to um, struggle with this a little bit. So I'm going to show you some, some ideas that you can really focus on the format and be more successful in answering this style question. And then we'll also be looking more at the essays, the long essay question, and also a little bit of the DBQ question tonight. So here is our breakdown. Last night, we did time periods one and two, and we focused on comparison. Tonight, we're looking at time period three, and our reasoning skills that we will be focused on are primarily causation. Think about what we're discussing, the American Revolution, the French and Indian War. We need to look at the causes of those topics, and we need to look at the effects. And then we also need to look at what changes and what remains the same after each one of those major conflicts. So causation and continuity and change over time fit perfectly with this time period. Let me remind you once again, in case you weren't here with us yesterday, our exam format for 2022 will be the traditional format for the AP US History exam. When you come to take your test on Friday, May the 6th, you'll show up and the first thing that you will do will be 55 multiple choice questions. You'll have 55 minutes to do those in and they're all stimulus based, which we'll talk about again in a few minutes. And that's the uh, major part of your score, 40% of your score. Then you'll do your three short answer questions and um, have 40 minutes to complete those. Then you have a short break. And when you come back is when you will write your two essays, the DBQ and the LEQ. So let's start looking tonight at a little bit of this content from time period three. And as I mentioned yesterday, when you are reviewing um, through these sessions with the AP Daily Live Review, we're not going into all of the details and the specifics of all of the content in time period three. There's just not enough time to be able to do that in each session. So there are more detailed videos about each of those important key topics in uh, time period three in AP Classroom in the AP Daily videos. So I encourage you, if you have topics that you need more information on, refer to those in uh, AP Classroom. So this is what College Board tells us in the, um, the content key concepts, what that we need to know for time period three. So of course, we're starting here 1754 with the French and Indian War. That's also referred to as the Seven Years War. It's the same conflict. Um, then we'll get into the American Revolution and the two frameworks for our government, the first one being the Articles of Confederation, and then what ends up emerging after the Constitutional Convention with the Constitution that we have today. We'll also be talking about what it means to be American and how that American identity begins to form during these early years between the French and Indian War and the American Revolution. And then we'll also touch on this issue of immigration um, and then movement within the United States as we begin to expand our territory. All right, so let's start right at the beginning of our time period, 1754, with the French and Indian War, as we said, also known as the Seven Years War. But look at those dates, 1754 to 1763. It's more than seven years. Well, the part of it that was fought in the United States or what becomes the United States in North America will 
um, you've got a, a difference in the timing in what's fought in, in North America and also what spills over into fighting in Europe. So there's going to be a little bit of a difference there. All right, so let's look at the cause here. The main dispute is going to be between France and Great Britain over who has control of the Ohio River Valley, which would be kind of between uh, Western Virginia and Pennsylvania at this time. So the Ohio River flows through there. It's very fertile land. Um, both Great Britain and France are going to claim this as part of their territory and their possessions. So a war breaks out. George Washington plays a, a key role in the opening of the French and Indian War. He's representing the governor of Virginia, Governor Dinwiddie, and he's sent out uh, to, to scout out the situation. Trouble begins and the French and Indian War will start. The outcome of this is going to lead us to the Treaty of Paris. Okay, so the British ultimately win the war and the Treaty of Paris, 1763, keep that in mind because there will be two treaties of Paris that we'll talk about today, have some very clear ramifications for uh, the territory in North America. Basically, France is gone. They lose New France and all of this territory that had previously belonged to France is now in the possession of Great Britain. There's also going to be more conflict with the natives. If you remember from yesterday, when we looked at the comparison of how each of these European nations treated their native populations or the native populations that lived within their colonies, the French were more or less um, trade partners. And so when France is gone, that's something that the natives are very worried about because now there's no restriction. What if the, the British colonists begin to move into their territory? Is there going to be more conflict and uh, less protection for their land. So they would much prefer the French to come back. That leads to Pontiac's rebellion where the native groups band together and they try to, to lure the French to come back in to show that the, the English really can't control all this territory. It doesn't work. The English, uh, I mean, the French are not going to come back into the war. The English are also very concerned about this uprising of natives in the West. Uh, this has been a very expensive war for them, and now they have all of this vast land holding that they now have to try to monitor and control. The last thing they want is more rebellion and more conflict and danger from natives. So they issue that proclamation of 1763, you may have studied this, where it was this imaginary boundary that kind of followed the, the uh, ridge line of the Appalachian Mountains that separates the new land that was acquired in the Treaty of Paris from the original boundaries of those 13 colonies. And the, this British proclamation says that the American colonists are not allowed to settle west of that boundary. So the American colonists are pretty frustrated because they have participated in the French and Indian War. They see this as an opportunity for them to move to the west, to have more land. Um, and now they're not allowed to go there, even though they have made sacrifices during the French and Indian War. So that kind of starts this unraveling of the relationship between the American colonists and uh, the British government. There's also massive debt in the war. And we've got the colonists who have seen their, um, their way to fight in the war. They've got a little bit more confidence in their ability to maintain control of the territory. So ultimately we end up with the American Revolution. So we've got a fast forward here to 1776 and we see that the American Revolution breaks out. So again, we're focusing tonight on causation. So what were the causes? Well, the French and Indian War, some of the outcomes of that French and Indian War lead us to the American Revolution. Let's look at some of these causes. And if you were to be asked a question, maybe a, a long essay question prompt, something about evaluate the causes of the American Revolution, you would come up with a, a, you know, different categories of causes and you would wanna evaluate those. That's something that you must do on your AP exam when you are writing your essays. Evaluate means to prioritize. If these are all causes of the American Revolution, which of these causes was the most significant? And can we group them together? So if we look at the taxation, that's imposed on the colonies to generate revenue for the British to pay for the debt from the French and Indian War. That was certainly a cause of the unraveling of the relationship. The end of salutary neglect, that was the policy where the British basically allowed the colonists to govern themselves within their colony, have a local government, 
as long as they were providing those economic resources that they needed. That goes back to mercantilism that we talked about yesterday. Well, that's all over with. So after the French and Indian War, there's going to be more strict oversight of the colonies by the British government. And so that's not gonna sit very well with the colonists either who are, are very accustomed to governing themselves. Uh, and then we have this idea of virtual representation when you may have heard before this idea of no taxation without representation and the colonists were clamoring for representation in the parliament of which they, they had none. Uh, and the British response to that was, well, you have virtual representation, meaning that all of the members of parliament represented every British subject in the world, regardless of where they lived. Most of those parliament members have never been to North America, so they don't necessarily understand the needs that the colonists uh, would need to have addressed by legislation in parliament. We've also got those enlightenment ideas from uh, the new enlightenment philosophers and, and political philosophers who are beginning to write about new ideas with government. It's not simply going to be a monarchy that everyone's going to accept as uh, the, the traditional form of government. There may be some new approaches to government that are out there. And then the growing American identity. They begin to view themselves not as much as British subjects as they view themselves as American, something different. And that's new because many of the, the colonists from the initial foundings beginning in 1607 with Jamestown up to this point in the 1760s and 1770s were very much uh, a part of British society, British culture. Um, they didn't view themselves as anything different. That changes here as we get closer to the American Revolution. And then certainly violence that begins to escalate. We're gonna see some, some key uh, violent acts, the Boston Massacre, where you see colonists who are killed by the British soldiers who are occupying Boston. All of these things taken together lead us down this path to the American Revolution. So can we make some categories here? If we think back to that pretend question about the, um, the causes of the American Revolution. Well, we could group these together, I think. These would certainly be um, British policies that are beginning to change and be forced on the colonists. I think we could group these together, which is about a, a different mindset, new ideas that are prompting the colonists to begin to think about rebellion. And then certainly violence would be a category of its own. And then you would wanna bring about some evidence to prove that. So then we fight the American Revolution, and then we have the effects of the revolution here. Uh, we've got more territory, so that all will be open to American expansion into beyond that proclamation line. And again, what are, what's going to happen with the relationship with natives? Other revolutions will be inspired. We certainly know that the French Revolution will follow on the heels of the American Revolution. The changing role of women. Women participated in helping with those boycotts with the Daughters of Liberty. Um, trying to come up with alternative goods rather than buying British goods. And then the idea of Republican motherhood that comes about later where we've got the role of women to raise children who are also very committed to these traditional American ideals that were very much a part of the American Revolution. We have questions about slavery and how is that going to square with the Declaration of Independence and this idea of all men being created equal and these ideas about um, uh, freedom and natural rights. How does that square with the slavery question? And then new forms of government and the economic impact. So there is a lot that's going on here. And at the root of it, I think we can look at many of these causes as having come from the French and Indian War. All right, so we're just going to zip through a few of these key components in the Revolutionary War in a timeline. So we've talked about some of the, the background here the new taxes that are imposed, the Stamp Act is a good example of that. We mentioned the violence and that Boston massacre. We've also got some other really key issues, that Boston Tea Party, uh, and then the result of that being the intolerable acts that will shut down the harbor at Boston, um, disband the legislature in Boston, that other colonies are seeing what's happening in Massachusetts, and it could happen there as well. So we begin to see this intercolonial uh, sort of a network beginning to form with the first Continental Congress, um, and then also the movement, the more violence at Lexington and Concord and Bunker Hill. We also have some of the writing that comes in, Common Sense by Thomas Paine, that's also going to borrow some of those Enlightenment ideas. And then the pivotal moment 
that Declaration of Independence that absolutely is squaring with the ideas of the Enlightenment. John Locke's idea of the social contract, where you've got this connection between a government and the people being governed, and they're in a contract and both have rights and both have responsibility, the government to protect the people and the people to follow the rules of the government. And if either side breaks a contract, then that contract is void, which is what they're writing about in the Declaration of Independence. Um, and then the war itself. So some of the key components of the war, not much goes right early on in 1776, right at the end of the, the year before they go into winter encampment, you've got the crossing of the Delaware and these surprise attacks on uh, in New Jersey at the Battle of Trenton. Battle of Saratoga, we see that as a turning point because that's what's gonna lure the French in to um, open their alliance um, because they see that maybe there is this possibility that their rival, the English, could lose to these American colonists. The winter at Valley Forge, we see a lot of leadership uh, on display with George Washington convincing those soldiers to stay around uh, and continue to fight. The French alliance is now in full force. And then with the help of the French, that battle at Yorktown secures the surrender. So then the end of the American Revolution, we have another Treaty of Paris, this one in 1783, that gives the Americans uh, the territory um, for themselves. The British are, are no longer in control of the United States. All right, so let's practice a couple of uh, multiple choice questions. We mentioned these yesterday, and we talked about the passages and how you want to look through them. Always start with the um, the identifying information, the Declaratory Act passed by the British Parliament, 1766. So I need to think back, all right, when is this? It's after the French and Indian War, but before the American Revolution. So this would be one of those policies that Parliament is imposing on the colonists. And so you would read through this very carefully. Uh, may it please your most excellent majesty that it may be declared in this present Parliament assembled and by the authority of the same that the said colonies and plantations in America have been, are and of right ought to be subordinate unto the dependent and imperial, uh, and dependent upon the imperial crown and parliament of Great Britain. So these colonies should be part of Great Britain and they should be subordinate to, not on their own to do what they want. And they of right ought to have full power and authority to make laws and statutes of sufficient force and validity to bind the colonies. So they're talking about the they here, it's talking about parliament, has the power to make any law that they want to on uh, the colonies. So when the colonies were kind of bickering and complaining about these unfair taxes, this is going to be the response. So let's look at the question, which of the following contributed most directly to the enactment of this law? So we're talking about causation. What caused this law to be passed? Well, if we look through these answer choices again, Eliminate those answer choices, true, false. Which one would be the most true? It's going to be this one, debates over how the British colonies should bear the cost of the Seven Years' War. So that's going to be very important for them. The other ones are uh, not applicable. So then look at the next question. Same passage, same key components. We're looking at um, the actions described in the excerpt most immediately led to. So if something leads to something else, we're looking at the effects of it. So the first question was about the causes that led to the law. Now we're looking at the effects of the law. So with this um, declare, declaration or declaratory act saying that parliament has power to do whatever they want to on the colonies, we're going to see that this will lead to new taxes on the colonies. So there is your correct answer. All right, and then the third question in this set, same uh, source. And then we're looking now, which of the following was the American um, colonist immediate response to the attempt? So how, how did this uh, end up playing out for the colonists? Well, they don't just roll over and take it. What ends up happening is we begin to see more boycotts and more action where the colonists coordinate and work together to try to protest. They still don't necessarily wanna break away and not be British anymore. They're not declaring independence. They just want it their way. All right, so let's practice now with an SAQ. So we mentioned yesterday that we want to um, look at these different types of SAQs. And so again, you'll remember you've got three questions that you answer, has to fit in the box, and you get one point for each task within the question. So part A, B, and C is each worth one point. 
we're looking today at the secondary source passages. Typically, this is the way the passage questions are going to be structured. They're gonna have two historians talking about the same topic, but having different opinions about it. And so they're, they usually are oftentimes, I'm not gonna say they will, I'm saying that it, this has been typical in the past few years, that you would be asked to identify the difference between the two authors' opinions. And then you would want to, in parts B and C, they're asking you to provide an example that would prove each author's claim. So here's how you wanna structure this. You wanna have um, in, in this first part where they're asking you to identify the difference between each author, you are not allowed to quote, do not quote from these passages. You have to put it in your own words and identify the broad difference. What is the issue around which they disagree? And then your evidence is to summarize author A in your own words, no quoting, and summarize author B in your own words, no quoting. All right, so let's look at a sample of this. Um, I've got a, a sample answer and a sample question for you. Okay, so if we look at this sample answer or sample question, this was taken from AP Classroom. This is yet again, another released exam question from the past. So we have these two historians, Gary Nash and Pauline Mayer, who are talking about the revolution in some way. So I want us to look more closely at what each has to say, and we're gonna mark up. So as we're reading, I like to, to try to mark some things um, that, that stand out to me. Although, and so he's a historian writing about the urban print, print crucible, 1986. Although 18th century America, so that's gonna be in the 1700s, was predominantly a rural agricultural society, its seaboard commercial cities were the cutting edge of economic, social, and political change. So this is telling me that the cities are important. In America, it was in the colonial cities, all right? So again, he's talking about the cities that the transition first occurred from a barter economy to a commercial one. The cities predicted the future. Urban people at a certain point in the pre-industrial era upset the equilibrium of an older system of social regulation and turned the seaport towns into crucibles of revolutionary agitation. So he's essentially saying that the source of the revolution is the cities, right? So the cities are the source of revolution. That's what I get out of this passage in my own words. Now let's look what Arthur, at, uh, what author B has to say. The colonist attitudes towards civil uprising were part of a broader Anglo-American political tradition. All right, so we're saying this attitude towards uprising. So that could be talking about the revolution. It was really part of a tradition. In the course of the 18th century, colonists became increasingly interested in the ideas of 17th century English revolutionaries and the later writers who carried on and developed this tradition. So we're saying that these ideas actually formed in Europe from other writers as the source of their ideas. By the 1760s, this tradition provided a strong unifying element between the colonists North and South. It offered to a corpus of ideas about public authority and popular political responsibility that shaped the American revolutionary movement. Spokesmen for this English revolutionary tradition were distinguished in the 18th century above all by their outspoken defense of the people's right to rise up against their rulers. So these ideas about revolution were being written about much earlier in Europe. All right, so just as we predicted, here are the questions. We're asked to find a major difference between Nash and Mayer's interpretation of the origin of the revolution. We're asked to give a, an example that would help to prove Nash's argument. And we're being asked to provide an example that would prove Mayer's argument. So let's look at what those would include. So here is my sample. I've got a, a sample answer here that I want us to look at. So A, we're trying to find what is the difference between the two authors. So if I look at what is uh, listed here, so here's how I answered this. I've got to put it in my own words. Nash and Mayer differ in their opinion about where ideas 
about revolution in the British colonies began. Where did those ideas begin? That's where they are differing in their opinion. So then I need to say how they differ. Nash believes that revolutionary ideas emerged from the colonial seaport towns as their developing economy encouraged independence. They don't want to be part of this mercantilism, uh, colonial um, economy anymore. They want to make their own money. In contrast, Mayer believes that European ideas from the Enlightenment found their way into the American colonies and sparked independent thought. Have I quoted at all from either author? I have not. All right, so then the next one, I've got to come up with an example of where there was a city that sparked revolutionary idea, where something's happening in the cities to support Nash. And then I need to have an, a, an example that would support Mayer. So let's look at my example for Nash. One event that could support Nash's idea about the colonial seaport economic development caused by the revolutionary idea would be the Boston Tea Party. So there's my answer. I'm saying that the Boston Tea Party is an example that would support Nash. Now I have to define it. I can't just throw out Boston Tea Party. I have to define it. So here's my definition. I said that it was the Sons of Liberty in the seaport town protesting what they felt was unfair tax on tea that burdened the colonists. By rising up in protest to dump the tea in the harbor rather than to pay the tax, the Boston Tea Party supports Nash's claim because here is the critical component. I can't just throw out the example. I have to say how it supports Nash's claim because the urban colonists of Boston were engaged in this type of open protest, which spread into other regions. So I have proven how or why does the Boston Tea Party answer Nash's claims. Then for mayor, the main idea of the Declaration of Independence being based and enlightenment theory could be used to support Nash's claim, Nash, or mayor's claim. So there's my answer, De Declaration of Independence. So I need to define how this is going to, to um, happen. So I'm going to say that the um, uh, revolution origin, that John Locke's ideas about the social contract justifying the overthrow of an unfair government described in the opening of the declaration would support uh, mayor's idea. Now I've got to prove how is it a support. It shows mayor's ideas because the colonists who wrote the document are justifying their action based on a European idea. So what we have here is an explanation of how or why this example proves mayor. And we've done the same thing with Nash. All right, so I hope that that example helps you to understand better how to use a um, uh, SAQ and answer those passage style. So let's review a little bit more of the content from time period three. And again, we're gonna go through this fast. If you need more detail, you wanna refer, refer back to the AP Daily video. So we're going to compare the two different forms of government. You first had the Articles of Confederation, which was very limited. The colonists were very afraid of, of going back into a monarchy. So they want most of the power left to the states. They don't want a strong leader who would emerge as a king. They want the colonists themselves to have their form of government. So concentration of the power was at the state. Later on, when we get the new constitution after events such as the um, Shays Rebellion and some of the other instances that show that this limited form of government under the articles is not the most efficient form of government, we have the new constitution that's ratified in 1788. It's different because we're not going to get rid of power with the state. We're just going to share that power now more with the federal government or the national government. Articles of Confederation, there was only a legislature. That Continental Congress was in place. Each state had their own representation. They voted. But under the new constitution, we're going to have separation of powers among the various branches of government. We're going to limit power for the Articles of Confederation. Primarily, they're focused on foreign affairs. We're going to expand that power, and it definitely include taxation as one of the uh, powers that the legislature will have. Each state could only have one vote, which means that a small state, such as New Hampshire, had just as much of a vote as the largest populated state, which was Virginia at the time. That changes, and we have a bicameral form of government in, uh, for representation under the Constitution, and then the way we amend it is also going to be a little bit easier under the Constitution. 
Also, some of our early presidents, we want to look at George Washington, John Adams here in this early period. Foreign policy-wise, we've got this proclamation of neutrality. When the French Revolution breaks out, George Washington wants no part of it. He believes as a new nation, we have no business fighting in this war uh, in Europe. Um, and then John Adams, also a Federalist or has Federalist-leaning ideas. George Washington didn't believe in political parties, but he was more in tune with those Federalist ideas that emerge as a political party. He's also going to continue to stay out of uh, that French Revolution, but he gets involved in that XYZ affair, which is the, the um, demand for bribe money by the French. Financially, Hamilton's financial plan is absolutely critical with George Washington's administration. I know that there's a good AP Daily episode on Hamilton's financial plan. I would encourage you to watch that. And then John Adams continues much of this same effort uh, for the, the Bank of the United States and this federal control of the economy. Politically, George Washington wants to avoid um, these political parties that he believes will tear the country apart. So he opposes those and tries to encourage people in his farewell address to stay out of those political parties, that if you get so consumed with what your party wants, you lose sight of what's best for the nation. John Adams takes things a step further and he tries to shut down his opposing uh, political party, the Democratic Republicans, by putting in the Alien and Sedition Acts, which will monitor and regulate uh, information that's being published uh, that could challenge government policies. And so that is going to, to come under great scrutiny as there is a, a certain um, obvious challenge here to this idea of the First Amendment rights that come with that new constitution. And then some other important events, you wanna think about all the precedents that George Washington set, stepping down after two terms as, as um, an office. Um, he could have run for more. There was no regulation that he had to step away. And then also conflict with natives in the Western Confederacy with the Battle of Fallen Timbers. Uh, and then certainly the Democratic Republican opposition and this growing division between those political parties. All right, so now let's practice and look a little bit more closely at um, the essay part of the exam. So the second part of the exam will be the essay. As we said before, it's gonna be after the break and you can see that you've got one block of time to write those two essays. So if we look at the rubric, okay, they're similar in some ways. The first introductory paragraph should have your contextualization, which is the backstory. What is the background that leads us to this topic or this issue in the essay? And then your thesis statement. How are you answering the question? What argument are you building? That's gonna be important. You need to make sure that when you write either of these essays, that your argument is the star of the essay. You don't want the documents of a DBQ to be the star. You want your argument to be the star and the documents become the evidence that prove that your argument is right. All right, so that's all gonna be laid out in the thesis. You've got your evidence and here's where we see some similarities. So these documents in the DBQ, you've got seven documents that you have to des or describe. You get credit for describing three of them accurately. Um, and then you've got to support your argument. How or why does that document or that evidence prove your claim? You're doing the same thing over here. You're just providing the evidence in the long essay question. You don't have a document that gives you the evidence itself. But you also have to explain how or why does it prove my argument from my thesis? And then you have outside information here in the DBQ, which was essentially the same thing as the evidence that you're providing in the LEQ. You're just drawing from outside where you've got those seven documents, you've got to bring in something new that you know about. Well, you're doing that for all of the evidence in the LEQ. Then the historical reasoning point in the LEQ, this is where you are using those historical reasoning elements that we talked about at the very beginning yesterday and today, causation, continuity and change over time, or comparison. And how are you framing your argument around those reasoning skills? So I like to tell my students to use that, um, the topic sentences within each paragraph to really emphasize what you're trying to do from, from those elements of reasoning. And then the complexity point is usually going to be a very um, unique argument that is developed. You could have some counter argument in there, but it's, it's going to be something that um, I would focus on really getting these six points 
Um, and these uh, five points over here down more solidly before you start worrying about that complexity point. All right, so let's look at a sample essay prompt. So we've got analyze the political development and military reasons for the United States victory in the Revolutionary War. This was taken from an old AP exam and I wanna adjust the wording of it to be a little bit more um, in line with the way that College Board has, has been framing their questions in previous years. So it's essentially the same question, I've just reworded it. Evaluate the reasons for the United States victory in the, in the Revolutionary War. So why did the United States win the war? Here's how you wanna do this. First, what is the question asking me to do? So if we're talking about the reasons for something happening, wouldn't that be um, a cause? What causes the United States to win the war? Then we've got to evaluate those. So if I have, this is a cause, this is a cause, and this is a cause, because I'm being asked to evaluate it, I need to distinguish one of those as more significant than the others. All right, so here's a planning sheet. I like to use this with my students. Here's my question over here. We've got causation I need to think about. So I get a point for contextualization, which is background. What is the backstory that leads to this information? If you've ever watched a, you know, a, a show that's being streamed, you know, you're binge watching, sometimes in that show, they give you last time on whatever the show is, <clears throat> and they tell you what's happened in the previous episode so you can catch right up. That's what contextualization is. What is the background? So if our question's about the victory in the Revolutionary War, well, let's talk about what led us to the American Revolution in the first place. And so that's going to be um, my contextualization. A good three to four sentences um, would be uh, sufficient. Two to three sentences uh, would be good for contextualization. Here's what I came up with my thesis statement. So I need to have three arguments because I need to have three body paragraphs or, or assertions. So here's what I said. While the American alliance with France was the most significant reason for the US victory in the American Revolution, George Washington's leadership, there's that word again, and British mistakes during the war were also contributing factors. So the French alliance I've got here is my most significant. So I'm going to emphasize that. Then I've got Washington's leadership. Here's some evidence that I would use within that body paragraph to prove my claim. And then British mistakes. I'm gonna talk about the loyalist uh, not being um, used effectively in the war, failure at Saratoga, uh, and all of these would be my pieces of evidence. All right, so how do you frame your paragraph? So here's how it's structured. I'm gonna have my first paragraph as my introduction, context and thesis. Then I'm gonna have my first body paragraph be the um, topic sentence which is my claim from my thesis. And I'll show you what I mean by that in just a second. And then I give my evidence. Then in my next body paragraph, I take my second claim from my thesis and I turn that into a topic sentence and I provide my evidence. And then my third body paragraph is again, my claim from my thesis and I use my evidence to explain my point. All right, so here's what I mean by historical reasoning. If this was my thesis, which we just saw, my three claims are right here. My first body paragraph will be my first claim for my thesis, the alliance with France. And I'm saying that's the most important reason why the Americans won the war. So here's what I have. My topic sentence would be something like this. The new, so we've got our introductory paragraph, context and then thesis. Then in my first body paragraph, look what I have. The newly formed alliance with France was the most significant reason for US victory in the American Revolution. So I'm again, evaluating. So this is a cause and this is the most significant cause. Then I go into using my evidence that I had listed before. Then my second body paragraph where I'm saying George Washington's leadership is also a contributing factor to the victory. Look at my topic sentence. It mirrors what I have from my thesis statement. George Washington's leadership during the war was also an important reason for the American victory in the Revolutionary War. Then I talk about things that he did in the war, specific examples that I link back and explain how or why this demonstrates his leadership. And then my third claim, British mistakes, will be my third body paragraph. The mistakes made by the British during the war also contributed to America's success. So that's how I'm going to frame my essay. All right, most significant, also important, contributed to.
and then I prove it. All right, so how many points would I get for this essay? I'm gonna get five points. I've got context and thesis. I've got good evidence. I have support of an argument um, in my thesis claims and by explaining how that evidence proves my thesis claim. And then I've got historical re reasoning that I use in the topic sentences. So I would give this essay a five, which is an excellent score. All right, now we're not going to, to get into a full DBQ tonight and look at um, all of these factors. Um, but I wanna just show you how you could turn this in um, to a DBQ. I made this up. This is not a real College Board DBQ. I totally made this up. I totally pulled together some documents that I think fit together in a certain way. Let me show you how you would plan this. Now we're gonna look at how you use these pieces of evidence in a body paragraph. That's what we're doing tomorrow. So come back tomorrow and we'll talk more about it. But look at this question that I made up. Evaluate the extent to which the, the victory in the American Revolution changed American society during the time period. So the first thing I wanna do, break down the question, what is it asking me to do? Which of these types of historical reasoning am I being asked to use in framing my argument? Well, we're looking at what changes in American society after the Revolutionary War. So this would be continuity and change over time. So what I need to consider when I look at the documents is what has changed and what has remained the same during that um, time period, okay? So again, if they give you a time period, you've gotta be very careful. Keep your answer within the time frame, 1776. So we can start with the Declaration of Independence. We can use common sense in there because it came out in 1776 and then up through 1810, which would be before the War of 1812, but it would also be after we've already elected Andrew Jack, I mean, um, Thomas Jefferson as president. Okay, so here's how we would frame this. So these are the seven documents that I, that I brought together. They're real documents, but they're just not a real DBQ. I made this up. So let's look at the, the, um, what they're asking here. So we have uh, Representative Richard Henry Lee writing a letter to his brother, Francis Lee, regarding the opening of the land beyond the Ohio River for settlement in July of 1787. So if you were with me yesterday, we talked a little bit about sourcing. As I go through and I look at these documents, I kind of make a jot list of what each one is saying. What's the general idea? And I've kind of shown you what I would do here. You would actually have a full segment of the letter that you're reading, but I make a jot list because when I do this in my test booklet or on a scratch sheet of paper, when my students are doing this in class, when I see them listed out like this, it's gonna be easier for me to group the documents to figure out what my argument will be. Um, so if I'm reading this, I'm gonna say, oh, Ohio River Valley Settlement, that's gonna be the Northwest Territory. Um, and so this is something about movement into the Northwest Territory. Mercy Otis Warren, she was a, um, a brilliant writer during the colonial period. And she wrote this essay really under a pseudonym uh, the Columbia Patriot in April of 1788. And that date should kind of go off in my head because that's where we're getting into the ratification debates of the new constitution. And what this document would be about if you were to read it, she's talking about that there is a lack of protection of rights there. And we know that she's um, also referencing and, and talking about that women should have more rights and be included in um, the discussion here of, of rights in this new form of government. And then we have George Washington's farewell address. We know that he warns against political parties. He warns against uh, joining in alliances in Europe. And then we have Judith Sargent Murray. She was uh, a woman who was also very, very much in favor of education for women. And so we have an essay from her on the equality of the sexes. Then Jonathan Edwards, we saw him yesterday in Sinners in the Hands of an Angry God, so we know that he's tied to the Great Awakening, but look what he's preaching about in this particular sermon in 1791, so it's, it's much later than the one that we looked at yesterday, but he's talking about the slave trade, and he's talking about the injustice of slavery, and then we have a political cartoon, and it's called the Congressional Pugilist, and that word, good SAT word, by the way, pugilist means a boxer, and so you have these people being shown in the new House of Representatives, notice it's 1798, so we've already got that new government formed, and they're actually fighting one another, and it's about these political debates. And then Thomas Jefferson, 
wrote a letter to Meriwether Lewis, and that's going to be the Lewis and Clark expedition. We'll talk a little bit more about that tomorrow as well. But he's giving him in those instructions for um, the journey. All right, so here's how we would want to group this. Our question, if we go back to the question, was asking us evaluate the extent to which the revolutionary, uh, the victory in the American Revolution changed American society. So can we automatically find documents that fit together in some way? Well, when I look at this, the first um, that thing that I always tell my students is that these documents are usually going to fit together Two fit together, two fit together, and three are going to fit together. That's usually the breakdown. And one of the documents can oftentimes fit in a couple of different categories. So when I do this, I'm going to say, all right, Meriwether Lewis and the Lewis and Clark expedition and this idea of the Ohio River Valley, that's talking about expansion and movement and migration of, of populations in other directions. So those two fit together. Can I find two more that fit together in some way? Well, we've got George Washington very clearly talking about political parties and warning against them. And then we see it playing out with this fight in the Congress and the political cartoon. Those fit together. Then I look at my last three. And if they fit together, then that's going to be the basis of my argument. If they don't fit together, I may have misread something. So these, I think, fit together pretty well because they're talking about people who don't gain new rights in this new form of government. So there's my continuity, right? So if we're saying that there's a change with expansion in the West and there's change with new political party divisions, what remains the same is that certain groups of people are not acquiring any new rights. So let's look at this planning sheet. So I think that's a pretty good pretend DBQ. Um, College Board might wanna borrow that from me. But anyway, I digress. So let's look at uh, how we plan this out. Continuity and change over time. We wanna start with our contextualization. What's the backstory? Well, if this is talking about the victory in the American Revolution, I'd probably talk about the same thing that I talked about in, in the LEQ, which is the background. What led us to the American Revolution in the first place? Here's my thesis statement. And my thesis statement comes from how I've grouped the evidence. The documents are my evidence. Whereas in the LEQ, I had to create my own evidence. So here's what I came up with. Although society changed after the American Revolution through the settlement of the new territory in the West and the emergence of political parties, previously oppressed groups of Americans continued to experience limited rights even under the new system of government. So there's my claim. Western settlement, I grouped together documents one and seven. That will become the evidence in my body paragraph that I have to explain how or why does this show a change? How is this different from prior to the American Revolution? Then the emergence of political parties, new political parties have formed, and we've got documents three and six that will support that. And I'm going to explain again how or why. I don't just let the documents star in my essay. They are not you know, all of this description, I need to build an argument. I need to prove that I am right about this. And then my continuity is that there are limited rights for oppressed groups that have continued. That existed before the American Revolution and it continues afterwards. All right, then we need to pull in that outside evidence. Remember that point from the rubric? So within each of these body paragraphs, could I come up with an additional piece of information that was not part of a document. I like to tell my students, if you could add a document, what would that document be about? So if I'm looking at this, one of the areas where I think that we could add a document with this idea of the political parties and the struggles, let's bring in something about the Alien and Sedition Acts. That would certainly show a change in how those political parties are influencing society. And then we could also bring about the Battle of Fallen Timbers. With this Western settlement, conflict with natives um, arises, and that's gonna bring us into the Battle of Fallen Timbers. All right, so we have done a lot tonight for sure. We've looked at two different essays. We've looked at a short answer question, and we've also looked at a lot of content. So this is, um, it's been a fast evening. We've got more detailed content as, as well. Um, if you are uh, needing that, looking at the AP Daily review videos. And then we have, again, focused on those rubrics. And we've also talked a lot about causation and continuity and change over time. So tomorrow's episode, we will be looking at time periods four and five. And 
Um, hold on tight because there is a lot of information that will be in this. We will start with Thomas Jefferson and we will go all the way up through reconstruction content wise. We're also going to take the DBQ and the LEQ, new prompts, but we're going to focus not as much on the planning of the document, but actually how you use that evidence. How do you prove your claim is correct? And we'll have a little bit more multiple choice practice. So until next time, keep reading and go make history.